Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone to the first presidential lecture on neuroscience at Boston University. And it is really a very special event. Not only do we have an outstanding distinguished speaker this afternoon, but we have an occasion to celebrate uh, what marks the, the first official function of the Boston University Center for Neuroscience. And uh, what I see when I look at the audience here, I'll come back to this in a minute, is colleagues and friends from both campuses coming together and braving Boston traffic, all of our medical campus colleagues to come over and inaugurate the lecture series. And I'm very, very pleased to see you here. It seems like a reoccurring theme in my professional life as a university leader to be blessed with a truly excellent faculty working in many aspects of neuroscience research. But as is true in many emerging areas of science and technology that are as broadly based as neuroscience, these faculty members have homes all across the university. Here they come from the departments of biology, math and statistics, psychology, cognitive and neural systems, all in the College of Arts and Sciences, biomedical engineering and psychiatry, neurobiology and anatomy and pharmacology and radiology in the medical school. And I know I've left a few out and from Sargent College. And what we have as a goal, and started a couple of years ago, was simply to create a set of opportunities for these faculty members and their students and postdocs to seamlessly collaborate and through their collaborations do outstanding high impact research and as well as to form the programs that will train the next generation of outstanding researchers through interdisciplinary graduate education. Seems simple, doesn't it? It's what everyone calls the theme in universities today of interdisciplinary research and education. Actually, our discussions on how to do this began several years ago over dinner and wine. And I'm looking out at the audience, and there were many people that were there that evening and learning about each other and learning about the opportunities. And I have to say that the roles of the faculty and its leadership have been absolutely essential to get to this event today. First, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Howard Eichenbaum, who agreed to assume the leadership of the center as its founding director. You'll hear from Howard in a minute. And to a great executive committee that nucleated to represent the breadth of the university. Uh, Dominique Sorrell, Dominique is not with us uh, this afternoon. Dave Farb from Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. Nancy Capel from Math and Statistics. Mark Moss from Anatomy and Neurobiology. Barbara Shin Cunningham from uh, Cognitive and Neural Systems. It's really a great group of colleagues representing the breadth of what's going on at Boston University in neuroscience. We've also had great leadership from leaders of our schools and colleges, from Karen Antman, the Dean of the School of Medicine, Virginia Sapiro, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Ken Luchin, Engineering, Gloria Waters from Sargent College, all who have been very uh, facilitating and, and very supportive of this effort. Finally, I'd like to give credit to uh, the great negotiator, Andre Ruchenstein, our Associate Provost and Vice President for Research, who spent endless hours, endless may really have meaning here, they may not be over, uh, <laughs> and has worked really tirelessly to have all of those discussions needed to bring a community of researchers together even in a place that is as collaborative as Boston University. It, it might surprise you today to say that what we've coming to do is to gain a greater understanding of the mind. may not surprise you that that's what we're doing. What I'd like to do is just end my remarks by uh, talking about what I hope uh, this afternoon uh, marks the beginning of. I hope this afternoon marks the beginning of a launch for a great set of collaborations between our faculty and students from all across the university and of great era for neuroscience research at Boston University. Finally, I'd like to recall Shakespeare when Petruchio in The Taming of the Shrew said, it is the mind that makes the body rich. I look forward to an intellectual richness that comes from what begins this afternoon and from hearing many, many good things from this community going forward. Let me turn to Howard Eichenbaum to introduce our speaker and my good friend, Bob Desimo. Thank you. Okay. 
Hello, everybody. I have the great pleasure and terrific honor of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Robert Desimone. I actually first met Bob, I don't know if he remembers, when I visited uh, the laboratory of Charlie Gross at Princeton when he was a graduate student, halfway is through his uh, career there. Um, once he finished his PhD at Princeton, he moved to NIH and established a laboratory there. Uh, was a laboratory member for several years before becoming the laboratory head for some years, and then eventually ascended further to becoming the scientific director of all of uh, NIMH, uh, which is a, indeed a very awesome responsibility, and he did some terrific things for uh, the intramural program at NIMH when he was there. Uh, he's uh, been awarded many academic honors, including to the election to the National Academy of Sciences, and now has very nicely, uh, for, lucky for us, has been recruited by Bob to, to uh, the Boston community and is currently the director of the McGovern Institute uh, over at MIT. Getting more to the science specifically, Bob did landmark work, really pioneering landmark work on the issue of how attention directs and instructs perception and the neural mechanisms by which that occurs. Uh, for that, uh, that's the cause of, of winning uh, the awards that he's accomplished. Uh, this has enormous impact not only for perception but for memory, which of course is the most important thing the brain does, <laughs> all of which we'll hear about the specifics of uh, today in his, in his uh, dive back into research and, uh, and, and off to some extent of administration. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce uh, uh, Bob, who's going to tell us about neural synchrony and selective attention. Thank you, Howard, for that very nice introduction. I am thrilled to be here at BU for many reasons. Uh, former Bob Brown did, in fact, uh, recruit me to MIT. I wouldn't be in Boston if it weren't for Bob. Uh, it was uh, Bob's uh, commitment to collaborative neuroscience that was one of the real attractions to going to MIT. If it weren't for Bob and Chuck Vest, we would not have our McGovern Institute building. It was Bob and Chuck brought the, the McGoverns to, to MIT. I remember one of, my, one of my first missions from Bob when I got to MIT was to, to bring together the imaging center between the MIT and, the, and Martinos MGH to get everybody working together so we can have an imaging center. And, and we have, and it's a wonderful imaging center working at MIT collaboratively with MGH. It's just, it's just every day we really were reminded of what, uh, what Bob did for neuroscience at and MIT, and it's just so exciting to see that Bob has made neuroscience a priority for BU. It's, uh, it's a wonderful neuroscience community here that I think is a bit underappreciated or maybe not quite as visible as it deserves to be. There's just so many fantastic uh, scientists, uh, neuroscientists here at, uh, at BU, the, uh, the Center for, for Brain and Cognitive Systems, the psychology department under Howard, uh, Steve's group with the, with the modelers, Nancy Capella, there's so many people, and even uh, I have to say I'm, I'm really happy to see in the audience Julie Sandell, who was an undergraduate at Princeton when I was a graduate student, and, uh, and, and I taught her in, I think, uh, or maybe her first uh, neuroscience uh, uh, laboratory class. Um, anyhow, it's just, it's just great. I feel like it's a homecoming coming here to, um, to BU, and I'm uh, really uh, thrilled to um, be able to tell you about some of the work we've been doing in my lab. So I'm going to tell you today about uh, work on uh, selective attention and neural synchrony. It's the, uh, the type of attention that we study in our lab is the type that allows the, uh, the student, for example, to concentrate on the, the uh, task at hand and block out all the distracting uh, information around her to get the, to get the job done. And uh, we know from work of psychologists that um, our select, the, select, the ability to selectively attend can have a profound effect on our visual awareness. And I'm going to give you a demonstration of, of how profound that effect can be. That was just, this particular demonstration was given to me by, by Ode Oliva at uh, MIT. It's a, um, it's, you're going to see a, a, a scene that, uh, in which there, there will be changes, sorry, changes taking place. Oops, what is going on here? Uh, and so all you need to do is pay attention and uh, see if you can note the uh, changes taking place in the scene. There. Everyone got that? They're major, major changes. You'll see it flash at the end. Um, I don't know if you picked that up, but 
uh, the people appeared in the scene that weren't there, the sign disappeared, the doors changed, the, the, the stores changed. I mean, basically the whole thing completely evolved be, uh, before your eyes. And, um, and I think this, this, I mean, I think is a, a really good demonstration that a lot, you know, we have this, this sense that we're aware of all the stuff around us all the time, but it's actually really an illusion. Uh, we're really, really aware of a tiny bit, and it's the part that we, that we pay attention to. And, and this is what we've been trying to understand and through work on, on, on the brain in my lab about how uh, this uh, comes about. And the particular uh, neural system that we've been studying is the visual pathway of the monkey, uh, which is illustrated here. This is the visual pathway that begins in the primary visual cortex and goes down into the temporal lobes through areas like V2, V4, and, and these uh, temporal lobe areas uh, that processes the visual features of objects in the scene. And we believe, and I'll be talking a lot more about this later, this is a system that's under the sort of top-down control of systems that are important for uh, control of attention, including in the parietal and, uh, and prefrontal cortex. So we've been, for many years, studying how attention affects the processing of objects uh, in scenes along this pathway. Um, and um, just, I'm not going to go uh, recount the now many years of the early work that we did on this system, simply to say that as you go along this pathway, uh, everyone knows that there's an increase in receptive field size along the pathway, so in the primary visual cortex, the neurons are sensitive to essentially the little pixels in the scene, whereas well, by the time you get to the temporal lobe, you have cells that are sensitive to the entire scene, the, uh, all, the, all the objects in the scene, um, and that uh, attention works by um, modulating interactions between the stimuli in these receptive fields so that by the time you get to the temporal lobe, uh, you may have only a representation of the attended object. And um, we, um, we developed uh, uh, models of how this comes about, and this was a particular mathematical model that was developed by John Reynolds in the lab, and I have to say that John uh, was a graduate student here with Steve and Gail, um, Steve Grossberg and Gail Carpenter, uh, and then came to my lab to learn physiology, and really it's, uh, he, had a, he just had a, had, had a profound effect on my own lab, and he's now gone off and is running a wonderful lab at the Salk Institute with this combination of modeling and neuroscience, which I think is so important. Anyhow, in, in the model that John uh, developed that in fact has many features of, of Steve Grossberg's models, uh, he had uh, a mathematical formulation for how it was that a neuron that received inputs from other neurons uh, could be biased by attention so that it would respond uh, primarily to one stimulus or another within its receptive field, filtering out the distracting information. So this all, this represented uh, sort of where we were at um, on the order of seven or eight years ago. And what we've come, the, the problem that we took on at that time was trying to understand more about how this attentional bias, this, this top-down attentional focus, how it actually changes the processing, the, 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 how, how cells um, process information uh, through their um, action potential trains. And the particular idea that we've been pursuing these uh, several years has been the idea that, neural, that uh, selective attention works at least in part through modulating the temporal synchrony of processing in the brain. And the, the core of the idea is that individual neurons get many different inputs. In fact, we know they can get thousands of inputs, and, um, and yet they only have one output. And, and, and in some ways, the problem that a neuron has is kind of a microcosm is of the problem that we have as an organism, right? We have all these inputs coming in, but behaviorally, we only get to, to usually orient or, be, or, or respond to one thing at a time, but neurons have to do the same thing. Thousands of inputs, one output. So what controls the output of the neuron at a given moment in time? Well, we know that, that neurons can integrate information usually only over a few milliseconds. So the idea has come about that if some of the neurons that provide inputs to the target neurons synchronize their activity in time so that their action potentials are lining up in time, like you see in this cartoon here, that these neurons would have a greater impact on the target neuron than neurons projecting in that whose, whose, input, whose firings are, are asynchronous in time. So by synchronizing inputs, you can control which subpopulation controls the output of the cell. That's the basic idea, and this is the idea that we've been testing in our um, experimental work. Now, this idea that, um, that uh, temporal processing is important 
for how the brain works, of course, is not confined to the problems of attention. It's a general issue in how the brain works. Uh, we know, uh, again, as I, I just mentioned, that neurons have uh, limited immigration times, and people who have actually studied these in integration times, as, is, as, in, as in this example that I've shown here, uh, that was published some years ago in Science where the integration time was measured by electrically shocking the inputs to certain hippocampal cells and then measuring how much jitter between these inputs uh, you could, the cell could tolerate uh, to get a certain firing rate out. And they found that, that the inputs had to be synchronized to within a few milliseconds to get uh, uh, spikes out of the uh, target cell. Um, we know from the work of Muming Pu and many others that it's also the timing relationship between the inputs to the cell and the outputs of the cell that determines neuroplasticity. That when you have the inputs and, out and outputs of the, tell of the same cell that are tightly synchronized in time, you can get long-term potentiation or the strengthening of connections, whereas if they become dissociated in time, you can get long-term depression or a breaking uh, of connections. Um, we know that uh, different neurons in the brain can have different um, timing relationships uh, with each other. And this is a really a striking example from the work of, of Klausberger and his, and his colleagues, which have shown that it, different cell types in the hippocampus synchronize their activity at different points of what's known as the theta, uh, the gamma rhythm and, rhythm and theta rhythm in the hippocampus. So with different cell types uh, synchronizing at different phases of this uh, cycle that I'll be telling you more about uh, later. And we know from the work of Howard Eichenbaum, uh, here Mike Halsamo and others who have shown that the, the role of this, um, the phase relationship between spiking and these global signals can carry important, important information about where the animal is in space and what kind of memories the animals are storing and so on. So, um, and we want to basically to bring this kind of approach up into the cortex to uh, understand attention. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is what was some of the, the initial evidence that we found that neural synchrony might play a role in attention, and then we'll go on and take on some of the, um, the secondary issues after that. So in, the, in the, our initial experiment to test whether uh, synchrony might play a role in attention, we trained monkeys to fixate patterns on computer screens. Uh, and um, we would always have at least two patterns and have the animal through instructions trained to attend to one pattern or another and at the same time we would record using multiple electrodes the spike trains of neurons and local field potentials uh, off the electrodes um, and then see how these, um, these neural signals were affected by what the animal was attending to on the screen. And I'm not going to go through all the details of tasks we use to train monkeys, but the basic idea is the monkey's fixating uh, throughout the trial, and we, and we reward the monkey for holding fixation. We can measure receptive fields of cells. A little cone and circle indicates where the animal's attending. And then in this particular task, um, there were little grading patterns, and the animal was cued to attend to one grading pattern or another. One could be inside the receptive field, and one could be outside. And the animal would release a bar when a, the grading pattern that was cued or at the t attendant location changed its color, and then it would get a, a juice reward. And the, um, uh, the, the uncued location or distractor location, there could also be color changes, but the animal would, would be trained to ignore those and only pay attention to the thing that had been cued on that trial. And then we could go um, back and forth and cue the animal to attend to another location, now ignore the location in the receptive field of the cells, and go back and forth and back and forth uh, looking at um, the effects of the animal's covert attention on the responses of cells to the stimuli in their receptive field. Now, I've mentioned this local field potential a number of times, so what's that? Well, anyone who's seen a raw signal coming over an electrode has seen that you have action potentials of cells riding on top of these slow fluctuations like you see here. And if you separately filter these raw electrode signals for the low frequencies versus the high frequencies, you get out the spikes in the high frequencies, and you get out these, these uh, slow fluctuations in the potentials uh, in, in the low frequencies. And it's thought that these slow potentials are coming mainly from the synaptic potentials of all the cells in a local volume of cortex, probably on the order of about one or two millimeters uh, in the cortex. Um, and that, for us, provides a very useful signal, a very useful time base, I guess you would say, for looking at the activity in a small volume of cortex, because you're looking at the sum of all the, in a sense, the sum of all the synaptic activity in that volume. Now, the traditional way that people have tested for 
uh, interactions between two neurons at a fine temporal scale is to look at the correlations in the spike trains of those cells from one neuron and another. Now, the, one of the problems with that approach is that if you just take two random neurons in the cortex located you know, a millimeter apart, the likelihood that these two neurons will be connected with each other and show high precision, temporal precision in their firing rate is very low for any two random neurons. But if you have a measure of the local activity in a volume and you can compare the firing of one cell to that local activity of a volume, then you have a much greater chance of detecting that a cell has synchronized its activity to a local population of neurons, and you can do this for one cell or another. Now, we know that the uh, firings of cells, does, they do have a relationship to this, to this local fluctuation of synaptic potentials, and one way you can see this is if you take the spike-triggered average of this local field potential as shown in this example here. So you just average the local field potentials occurring at the same time as the spikes, and what you can see here is that the action potentials are occurring at the time of maximum depolarization in this local population, and then you can see there's this kind of ringing structure around it. And that ringing structure tells you that there must be some oscillatory pattern in, in the uh, fluctuations of these synaptic potentials, and cells are synchronizing their activity to these oscillatory patterns that might occur at di in different uh, frequency ranges. Now, when, you, um, when we do this experiment that I just described, having monkeys attend to one stimulus or another, either inside the receptive field or outside, uh, we collect data uh, such as uh, what you see here, which is an example summed from a large population of E4 neurons, which is an area that's intermediate along that processing pathway that I described. What you can see, and this is a conventional firing rate histogram, not taking into account temporal structure. The red line is the firing rate when the animal is attending to the stimulus in the receptive field, the blue line when the animal is ignoring the stimulus in the receptive field, and you can see that there's a greater firing rate when the animal's attending to that stimulus in the receptive field. And, and even though that the same physical stimulus is there in the ignoring condition, the firing rate has been suppressed if the animal ignores it. And if you look at that spike-triggered average of the local field potential, which is shown here, again, with the red line and the attended condition, the blue and the, is the unattended, you can see that there's a greater amplitude of this average and more structure to it when the animal's attending to the stimulus in the field. And we would like to be able to quantify these effects of attention on this temporal structure. So the way we do that is we take that, again, we take the raw electrode signal, you pass it through either low frequency filters or high frequency filters. We use the multi-taper filter technique developed by Parthometra to analyze the um, coherence between the spikes and the local field potentials in different frequency bands, and you get out in this coherence measure uh, a number that ranges from zero to one, where zero means there's no relationship, and one would mean there's an absolutely constant relationship between the phase and amplitude of the spikes and the, um, and the local field potential. And we do this both within electrodes, and you, we do this across electrodes uh, as a control to make sure that the spikes we're recording from aren't actually generating the local field potential on that same electrode. If we, if we get the local field potential from a nearby electrode, then we don't have to worry about any cross-contamination. So we go through all this. We record from these uh, neurons in V4 under these conditions, and this shows the coherence spectrum uh, averaged across a population of cells. So what do we see here? Well, first thing we see is that the spectrum has this big peak in this range from about 40 to 60 hertz. And in the frequency world, this is known as the gamma frequency band. This means spikes are occurring within a couple tens of milliseconds uh, in, in relationship to some structure in the LFP. And that's, and from all we know about cell integration times, that's sort of the sweet spot for, um, for the, um, in the time range that cells will integrate uh, synaptic inputs. And the other thing that we see is that attention is affecting this uh, spectrum so that you get more coherence in this gamma frequency range when the animal is attending to the stimulus in the field than when the animal is ignoring it. And if you compute an index of these attentional effects for coherence and firing rates, you can see that if anything, the effects of attention on coherence are actually larger even than the effects of attention on the absolute firing rate of the cell. So this is all consistent with the idea that maybe uh, the attentional mechanism is working through modulating the temporal structure of the uh, spike trains of the cells. 
So one question you could ask, though, is, okay, so we get out these arbitrary coherence values, and how much would a change in coherence of that magnitude matter postsynaptically? And what you'd really like to be able to do is record from the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell and measure the effects of synchrony on the, of the presynaptic cell on the postsynaptic cell. And, uh, and I would say up until very recently, we have not had the uh, possibility of doing that, although there's some recent developments in the field that I think they're going to give us that capability very, very soon. Uh, but up till now, the way we have of testing it is through modeling. And, um, and this is just a, uh, a simple model that was uh, created by Steve Gotts in my lab of a, um, of a neuron getting um, in inputs that could be either synchronized or, or not in time and measuring the effects of synchrony on the output firing rate uh, which is shown here, which is the input firing rates of the cells and the output firing rates of the cells as a function of the coherence of, these, uh, of the inputs. And in this case, he just modeled the, um, the local field potential through the integrated synaptic potentials in this model. And what you can see here is, first of all, of course, the output firing rate goes up with the input, input rate, but also that this, the um, firing rates go up as you increase the coherency of the input firing rates along the same range that we find in our uh, attentional manipulations. Now, there's a substantial effect at all firing rates, but as a proportional effect, you can see that the, the, the biggest effects uh, of a change in coherence on output firing rates is at low firing rate frequencies. And if you think about it, this makes sense because at really high frequencies, there's so many spikes in short periods of time, it doesn't matter that much if they exactly line up to the millisecond. But at low firing rates, which is what we typically find in the cortex, uh, you get a big bang for your buck by lining those input spikes up in time. And they can have a dramatic effect on firing rates. And, um, and I should say that this model was developed before we um, before we had evidence that the output cells might also be synchronizing their, act, their responses to the inputs. And uh, we now are, are beginning to understand that when the inputs and outputs are synchronized, then you can have even more, uh, a more dramatic effect of, of synchrony on firing rates. And Nancy Capel has just published a very nice uh, model uh, showing um, how, that, uh, how that can come about. Um, um, uh, how that can come about. Anyhow, so. I now want to um, address the question of, okay, so we know that, that these um, the variations in synchrony can have a, a, an effect postsynaptically, but the, the obvious question comes up is whether they might have an effect behaviorally. Do they, do the, does this influence the animal's behavior anyway, that cells might synchronize their activity? Well, in the particular task we use, um, there was an aspect of the task that allowed us to answer the, ask this question. In this test, the animal's paying attention uh, uh, to a stimulus in the receptive field or a stimulus outside the field looking for a small uh, color change. And what we noticed in the animal's performance is sometimes the animal's very quick to, to detect the color change and sometimes the animal's very slow to detect the change. I should say in the experiment, the color change was very, very slight, very difficult to detect. So sometimes the animal took a while for the animal to notice this, okay? And we asked, oh, maybe variations in the coherent uh, the synchrony of activity along this pathway might, pr might explain why the animal was better on some trials than on others. So this is what we looked for uh, in the data. We looked at the, um, we synchronized the data on the color change of the stimulus on the, in the receptive field. And then we looked backwards in time from that color change to see whether um, the, um, the degree of synchrony affected the animal's speed at detecting the change. We divided trials into the quarter of the fastest trials and then the quarter of the slowest trials uh, in the animal's performance. The, the solid lines show the fast trials, the dashed lines show the slow trials. And what you can see here, as you look backwards in time, uh, there was greater gamma power uh, on the fast trials. There was more coherent activity uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the fast trials, but there didn't seem to be any variation in firing rate on those fast trials compared to the slow trials. So having more coherent activity uh, um, seems to lead to greater efficiency in processing and, and, a, and a better behavioral uh, performance uh, on these stimuli. And uh, I should also say that um, uh, we, um, as a control, looked at whether uh, synchrony at the unattended location 
uh, predicted the animal's performance on this task. And actually, we found an inverse relationship there. So if at the un unattended location, the cells were more synchronized at that location, the actual animal was actually slower at detecting a change inside the receptive field. So it was specific to just the place that the animal was attending. You needed the synchronized activity to get efficient neural uh, processing. So those of you know about the structure of the cortex, the cortex is a very uh, complex structure. And one of the obvious things about the structure is, is that it has a, a laminar structure with different cell types in the different lamina. And um, Beth Buffalo, when she was in the lab, asked whether there might be variations in neural synchrony according to the uh, lamina in which the cells were located. And indeed, she found in this area V4, which we, which we focused a lot of our experiments, there was a dramatic difference in, um, in synchrony between the superficial layers and the deep layers in the cortex. Where all of this gamma synchrony that we had been finding in these experiments, this is what's characteristic of the superficial layers, the top uh, layers of the cortex. Whereas in the deep layers, there's almost no gamma synchrony. Instead, it's a very low frequency, or known as the alpha band of synchrony, or somewhere around uh, 10 hertz, uh, and, and an inverse relationship uh, between it, the attentional effects on gamma and the attentional effects on alpha. So when you attend to a stimulus, you increase the, the gamma frequency synchronization and decrease this alpha frequency sy synchronization. And this turned out to be true not only in V4, but at every area that we studied along this processing pathway in V1, V2, uh, and V4, all had the same structure, that it's these, the uh, superficial layers with the, that have the gamma frequency synchronization modulated by attention, and the deep layers uh, do not. We found another um, difference uh, between the superficial and, and deep layers and a difference that uh, also shows us the progression of attentional effects along this pathway that's illustrated here when we looked at the firing rates of cells, which just shows the uh, conventional firing rates averaged across populations in cell of cells in areas V1, V2, and V4 in both the superficial and deep layers. And the attentional effects on firing rates are also greater in the, uh, in the superficial layers. And if you look at the time at which attention affects firing rates in these layers, what you can see here is that the early effect effects of attention occur in V4, they occur later in V2, and they occur latest in the primary visual cortex, which is suggesting this a backwards progression of attentional effects uh, moving backwards along this processing uh, pathway that's involving the firing rates of cells and this gamma frequency uh, synchronization. Now, what is the what is the, the functional meaning of this difference between the different cortical layers? Uh, and this is something that we're actively working on right now. It's the superficial layer cells that are the source of both feed-forward cortical, cortical connections and short-range feedback cortical, cortical connections, whereas it's the deep layer cells that are, um, send their outputs down to subcortical structures, including lots of structures with, um, uh, with visual motor functions. Um, we have ideas about what this difference might mean. I know Steve Grossberg has a published idea about the uh, difference in synchrony between the superficial and deep layers related to um, uh, whether um, um, the, the visual input meets the animal's expectation or not. We have ideas about visual motor, uh, the, the visual motor role of uh, alpha frequency synchronization in the deep layers, and this is something that we hope we can get uh, sorted out uh, in our upcoming experiments. But at least we, we will c conclude from the uh, effects of attention on firing rates and synchrony that, um, that we have to think about this attentional system as, a, as one that works in a kind of a backwards way, whereas the visual processing proceeds from the earliest areas down through these later areas with more complex processing and, and larger receptive fields, the attentional effects are working the way, way backwards through the more advanced areas and finally reaching back to the earliest parts of the system, modulating cells with the finest features and um, and smallest receptive fields. OK, so um, now I want to get to the, um, what, what are the, the sources of inputs that are, are um, affecting uh, synchrony along this processing pathway, setting up this backward chain uh, of attentional effects along uh, this pathway. And the two, as I mentioned, two of the um, obvious candidates are in the parietal cortex and prefrontal cortex based on lots of evidence uh, in neuroscience. Uh, damage to these regions lead to 
problems in controlling attention. You can have neglect syndromes in people with, with damage to these uh, regions. Um, recording experiments in monkeys from the Goldberg Anderson labs, for example, Earl Miller's lab, and, and many others uh, recording in the, in the frontal cortex have seen properties consistent with a role in the top-down uh, control of attention. Um, and uh, we uh, uh, asked the question of whether we could find direct neural evidence that, uh, that in this case, the frontal eye fields and the prefrontal cortex might be a source of inputs to synchronize activity in this intermediate area V4 in which we focused a lot of our attention. So we did uh, um, uh, simultaneous recordings in area V4 and the frontal eye fields to see, to test this idea that the frontal eye fields might be a source of synchrony. And the particular, we use a slight variation on the task I described previously, in this case, the animal would be sh is shown a color cue, is given uh, later sees three colored gratings, and he has to pay attention to the grating that matches the color of the previously presented cue, uh, and then waits for that stimulus to itself to change color back to white. Uh, so again, it's another task where you, um, if ta it requires the animal to focus its, its attention and, and ignore uh, distractors. When you record in a task like this across these two areas and look at the coherence spectrum, you see results such as those here, which are results that were obtained from Steve Gotts and Georgia Gregorio in my lab. Uh, this shows the coherence spectrum in V4, which looks just like the ones you've seen previously. You see the attention enhance, enhancing the gamma frequency synchronization in the superficial layers. In the frontal eye fields, uh, you see the same sort of effect. You see gamma synchronization there. Attention enhances gamma frequency synchronization in the frontal eye fields. And now if you look across structures, either spikes in one structure, and uh, FEF and, and, and LFPs in V4, or vice versa, you see, if anything, the strongest synchrony that we've seen, I think, in any of our experiments where uh, uh, attention is enhancing the synchrony between uh, the two structures. One of the surprises, though, that we found in, in looking at these data was there's something, a, a, a very striking difference in, in the fine temporal structure of these attentional effects across areas compared to within areas. Now, I showed you these spike-triggered averages of the local field potentials before, which both, in both V4 and FEF have spikes lined up with this maximum depolarization phase of the local environment in terms of synaptic potentials, as you see here, lined up at time zero. But if you look across structures, you can see there's a, a dramatic shift of about half a cycle in phase uh, across areas, either going from FEF to V4 or from V4 to FEF, you, as you can see here in that spike-triggered average. And um, if you look at the phase relationship of LFPs across the two areas, you see the same, uh, you see the same difference. And this is just this is LFP LFP coherence across the two structures. Uh, here's the gamma frequency enhancement of, of local field potentials, and here's the phase. Um, uh, this is the uh, phase shift uh, of about 10, half a, degree, half a cycle or about 10 milliseconds across the two areas. And um, raising the, the, the possibility that there's either, if, it's, if this works in frequency space, there's a, there's a half cycle phase shift between the two areas, whereas if the difference is a time difference between the two areas, you would expect to see the same difference uh, the same time difference at different frequencies, and that's exactly what we find. If you go to a much lower frequency range, the phase shift changes such that you still get about a 10 millisecond <coughs> shift uh, between the two uh, areas. Um, and when we first looked at these data, we thought, well, this is really crazy. Why would the brain do this? That within an area, you have everything built so that the cells are firing at times when they're going to have the maximum impact on their neighbors, and it's all going to be self-reinforcing and so on, and, and attention enhances that and so on. And why would you want spikes to be at the worst time uh, when they would be entering another area to influence their activity? And then, of course, we began to think about the fact that that neural information does not travel at the speed of light in the brain, uh, and it, it actually takes time for neural information to get from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, and vice versa, and there's synaptic delays, and so on and so on. So, um, in fact, we convinced ourselves that this is exactly the way the brain should work. The brain has to build in these time delays. And up until this point, uh, there, although other people particularly the lab of Wolf Singer had been showing synchronization of activity across cortical areas in certain circumstances, it, it, they'd always seen zero phase lag synchronized activity. And when you think of it this way, 
It's, that's actually the kind of crazy thing why you want zero phase lag synchrony across brain areas because it doesn't allow for any transmission time between areas. And instead, it actually suggests common input varying uh, these areas. Whereas when you have two areas trans transferring information between one another, then you've got to build in these time delays so that everything, uh, so the information that comes at a time when the cells are prepared uh, to receive it. In fact, so this is how we now are thinking about these uh, cross-area interactions is they have to take into account these time delays and that these time delays may be very finely tuned for the, the, um, the distances between areas, how many synaptic connections you have between areas and so on and so on, so that when a cell fires in V4, the action potential, potential arise in the, in the FEF at a time when the cells are maximally receptive for receiving that re spike, they're the most depolarized and that one input spike might push them over the edge and vice versa and so you could set up a self-reinforcing oscillation of activity across the two um, brain regions. Now you could ask, okay, and, and when you have coupled oscillators, it raises the issue of, of um, you know, what, what initiates these, these uh, coupled oscillations across areas and um, um, that's, that's something that we're still working on in, in the frequency domain, but we got a clue into this from the time domain, but simply looking at the uh, latencies of these attentional effects in the two areas. That in the FEF, uh, we find that attention begins to affect the firing rates of cells earlier than it affects the firing rates of cells in V4. It looks like they begin in FEF and around 10 or 12 milliseconds later, they begin to affect the cells in V4, suggesting that it's the frontal cortex that are initiating these, um, these effects and, and starting the oscillations. And of course, once they get going, then they're going to be self-reinforcing uh, across areas. And uh, if we look at the phase spectrum of the uh, LFP, LFP interactions, and, um, and then the interactions from one area to the, to the other, uh, V4 to FEF and vice versa, we can see that, that once these attentional effects get started, then they quickly uh, spread across different frequencies and, and, and different aspects of the interactions across, uh, across the two areas. This, as I said, may be a general principle for how uh, brain areas uh, communicate with, each one, with one another. And I just want to cite a couple recent examples from the literature. This is from the work of Sagar, Vidi Sagar in, in, um, in Australia, who found similar evidence for interactions between area M MT and LIP in the parietal cortex in a task that ha monkeys were paying attention to a stimuli and ignoring distractors. And he was also seeing that attention enhanced the coherent activity between uh, these two brain structures in a, in a very uh, comparable way. And uh, Earl Miller at MIT, looking at interactions between the frontal cortex and the parietal cortex, looking at coherent activity between the two structures, again sees an effect where attention enhances the coherent activity in both a, a, a pop-out task and a visual search task across the two, to each other, across the two areas. So this, I think, is going to turn out to be a very general principle of uh, communication across uh, brain regions. And in our own work, we found evidence uh, for these kinds of interactions using uh, MEG in human subjects, which is work that was done uh, at the NIH, uh, in which we had uh, human subjects uh, performing a task very similar to the one that we used in our monkeys. In this case, they would get a spatial cue and they present it with um, uh, checkerboard patterns that changed in color and they had to monitor them for the color change. And then we, MEG is a, is a, uh, a technique where you can look at activity at, at the millisecond time scale uh, in humans, uh, not unlike what we can see in monkeys, although the spatial resolution of the technique is much poorer. But for these experiments, we don't actually care that much about the spatial resolution. We just want to look at the time structure. And when we do this experiment in people and look at that time structure, we see results that seem extremely similar to what we find in monkeys. We're looking at, if you look at coherent activity between the frontal eye fields and the occipital cortex, uh, when the animal, well, sorry, when the person's attending to the left or to the right, you see this, um, uh, the colored uh, bands here indicate uh, coherent activity in this high gamma band uh, that's the appropriate uh, in the appropriate hemisphere when the subject attending to the right or the left, um, just like we see in the monkeys. And this is coherent activity across uh, the, two, um, the two brain regions. And so in the last few minutes, then, I, I do want to talk, um, talk about a different aspect 
of, uh, of selective attention, which I have um, ignored in, in all of this work uh, so far, which has been a, attention that's not restricted to a location in space. Uh, and it's not restricted to a case where we have in this fairly artificial p uh, condition where animals are trained to fixate and attend to things off of fixation. Normally, we control our own attention. We look around rooms. We, we, we try to find things and so on. And so we've been, um, we've been asking whether these same kinds of, of, of synchrony mechanisms work in this case where we're attending to visual features of things under our own control uh, and whether we might see these same kinds of interactions across brain areas in this less uh, controlled situation. And the kind of task that we use is what psychologists have called visual search. For example, in this scene, if I ask you to find the flag in the scene, uh, you can do that based on its features, even though you don't know where it is in advance. We do these kinds of things all the time. Uh, and we gave so a similar task to our monkeys, basically find the flag, or in this case, uh, find a target stimulus in a big array of, of other stimuli. Uh, and we had both a color search task and a shape search search task. Uh, the, in this color search task, the animal would be given a color cue, and it could look around using its own free will until it found something matching the color of the cue. And in the shape, shape search task, it did the same thing for stimulus shape. Uh, and then it would just fixate the stimulus matching the cue under both conditions, and it would get a, a reward. And, and, um, and what I'm first going to uh, tell you about is work that was published a couple years ago, and then I want to tell you about some of the most recent work that we have in the lab. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the work that was published with Narcisse Bichot a couple years ago, what we asked was, um, was there an effect of the animal's attention to feature on a stimulus in a cell's receptive field in a case specifically when the animal was not focusing spatial attention on that stimulus. So the animal's preparing a saccade to another stimulus in the ray. We have a stimulus in the receptive field that may or may not be the thing that the animal's looking for. And we ask, does it make a difference if the thing in the receptive field has a feature that the animal's looking for or not? Well, we know that the animal's not focusing spatial attention on that location. And when we do that analysis, we find that indeed that activity uh, the firing rates of cells are enhanced in exactly that situation. And that's shown in the, uh, the red line here, which is the firing rate of cells when the stimulus in the receptive field is the preferred one for the cells, and it matches the cue that the animal's searching for in the task, and lower levels of activity under every other uh, condition. And likewise, we see more coherent activity in this gamma frequency range when that, the, the receptive field holds the stimulus that the animal's looking for, but the animal hasn't found it yet. Um, and uh, we also see an effect of the animal's spatial attention so that, when, of course, when the animal is, is going to saccade into the receptive field and fixate the stimulus that it is looking for, um, uh, if we look at that response compared to a case where the animal is going to look away, then there's an additional enhancement of response uh, in that case um, when the animal makes that saccade into the receptive field, which is shown here, which is the, just again, in the firing rate histogram where the red line shows the case where the animal has now selected that stimulus within the receptive field uh, compared to a case where the animal is going to ignore that stimulus in the receptive field. And there's a further modulation of, um, of response. So in this sort of, sort of cartoon summary of what we think is going on during visual search, what we see here, these are feature maps in the cortex, like we see in V4, maps of, of the colors and shapes and so on of stimuli in the visual field. Here's the kind of display the animal will be looking at. This might create these uh, activity patterns in the cortex, which are spatially laid out uh, in these maps with things like red and green and so on, uh, that these are biased in favor of the fe things that the animal is looking for by some source of the target template. And we'll say that for the moment that uh, maybe these are coming from uh, parts of prefrontal cortex. And then we see that after a period of time, uh, when the animal does find the target or finds a candidate target, and the animal is then going to make an eye movement to it, then the maps are primarily reflecting that selected stimulus. That's where you see the maximal enhancement of activity when the animal is now finally selected uh, that target. And in the most recent work, what we've been trying to understand is how you get from here to here, how you go from candidate spots or or, or spots of potential targets in the visual field in these feature maps to, these, to this modulation in favor of the actual target location uh, at a later point in time. And again, for this 
well, we've been doing combined recordings in area V4 in the frontal eye fields to see whether the frontal eye fields might be the place that bridges that gap. And indeed, that's exactly what we find. Um, that in this case where the animal's doing this uh, search for, t for, for stimuli based on, um, on, on, their, on their color, what, uh, what I'm showing you here are the responses in the frontal eye fields in V4 in the case where uh, the stimulus in the receptive field matches what the animal's looking for, and that's the red line, compared to the case where the stimulus in the receptive field is not what the animal's looking for, and that's the blue line. And what you can see is in both structures, um, there's, a, there's enhanced activity when the stimulus in the receptive field is holding what the animal's looking for, even though it hasn't found it yet. It hasn't made an eye movement there. It doesn't know it's there. But it's as though the cells are saying, we have what you're looking for here. You haven't found this yet, but we have it here. And what's the, the, the most relevant part of this is that in V4, there's all tons of color information about the cells. And so maybe it's not so surprising you see this biased activity there. But in the frontal eye field, there is no color selectivity. These are just maps, essentially, of salient stimuli. It's a, it's a maps of of how relevant the stimuli are at that moment. And, and so you see this reflected in the frontal eye field activity. And most importantly, it occurs after these effects in V4, suggesting that you set up the biased maps back in these, feet, in these areas selected for color and so on. The activity gets sent off to the frontal eye field, where you now have these representations of relevant salience. And then what happens next? Well, what happens next is the frontal eye field picks the stimulus. And that's what you see here, which is the case where now the animal's selecting that stimulus in the receptive field. The animal's about to make an eye movement there. This is the red line showing the firing rates in the frontal eye field under that circumstance compared to the blue line where the animal's selecting a different stimulus. So you can see this enhancement activity that now begins very early at 54 milliseconds compared to V4, which is now later than the frontal eye fields. So now you see the final selection of the target first is happening in the frontal eye fields, then can sit back to V4, where now you have V4 representing the thing that the animal's finally selecting, attending to, and this is what's in the animal's conscious awareness and so on. Uh, and um, and you see, so you see this back and forth, back and forth across areas. So the way we think, at least right now, the way we think this is working is you go from the feature maps back in visual cortex, biased in favor of candidate targets in the visual field. You go through the frontal life field salience map you have some selection process in front of eye fields, maybe some winner-take-all competitive uh, network. You get, you get that selection of the final target. It goes back into V4, modulates activity in favor of that target, and that's what you end up, again, perceiving, attending, remembering, and so on. So that's, um, I know it's a long, uh, complex story, um, a long, complex road, uh, reciprocal connections going, us, going from the early sensory uh, perception to, um, to final uh, awareness, attention, and memory. Um, but um, it's, it's, this, this very simple process of, of, it, of, of, of the initial sensory input resulting in this um, uh, attended stimulus in the brain seems to require the integrated activity of, in fact, most of the brain. Almost every area we study in the brain seems to be playing some role uh, in this process. And we know and it's not just the activity uh, in these uh, structures, but it's the fine temporal structure of activity in these structures, uh, and that has given us a lot to try to understand. And I want to uh, acknowledge the collaborators in these studies. Um, the, um, the early synchrony results were done with Pascal Fries uh, when he was a postdoc in my lab. This has been later continued with Theo Womelsdorf, and who's now with Pascal in, in, Ny in Nijmegen. Uh, all of the uh, laminar work was done uh, by Beth, Beth Buffalo, who's now, now in the faculty, uh, at uh, Emory, and the visual search work uh, and the interactions with the prefrontal cortex have been, were done with uh, uh, Narcisse Bichot, Steve Gotts, Georgia Gregorio, uh, Wei Wei Tso. Uh, Partha Mitra is a long-standing collaborator, uh, helping us with lots of the methods we use to analyze our data. And the human imaging work was done with Zhushan Lu, uh, who's at MIT, and then uh, Lin Chen at the Chinese Academy of Science, and uh, Leslie Ungerleiter at NIMH. And thank you very much. So we're not, we're not doing questions, so we'll close it out. <laughs>
In the interest of having uh, the informal reception and not compromising its time, we're not going to have a formal question and answer period, but I understand Bob will be there and he'll, you may pursue him with your questions as we go along. So I just want to close this part of it by two with two thank yous. First to Bob Brown, who both inspired and has supported uh, the development of the Center for Neuroscience and in particular this lecture, and finally to Bob Desimond, who told us how attention works today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot.